Okay, uh, let's get started. A uh, few housekeeping notes before uh, we jump back into lecture today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to advertise an upcoming talk this Thursday by uh, Tan Lee. Um, Tan is the CEO of Emotive Corporation. And towards the very end of the semester, we're going to talk about uh, cyborg technology and brain computer interaction. So BCI is the idea of creating computer technology that reads your thoughts and interprets your thoughts and acts on your behalf. So one of the most interesting, the most recent, and the most controversial form of human computer uh, interaction. Uh, the Motive Corporation is leading the way in developing a particular form of uh, EEG headset uh, that you wear, and indeed it can read your thoughts. Again, an interesting and controversial technology. Um, I realize we're all very busy at this time of year, but I guarantee you this will be a very, very interesting lecture. He will present this technology, which again we'll talk about towards the end uh, of the semester. Uh, the talk is this Thursday, I Ira Allen Chapel, 5 to 6 p.m. <laughs> Um, she will also be conducting a live uh, demonstration of her EEG headset. Um, she will invite someone to come up from the audience, wear the headset, and within about 180 seconds, the device will uh, train on that person's particular brain activity and be able to read their thoughts. Uh, this volunteer has to be someone who can remain relatively calm on a stage in front of several hundred people. Why does that matter? If you're nervous in front of a bunch of people, it's going to make it very difficult for the device to read your thoughts, right? Physical and social context, yet again. You also have to have relatively little hair in order for the EEG electrodes to be able to record just under the scalp. Um, and this volunteer is going to be a very senior member of the UVM administration. This person does not know that they're going to be the volunteer yet, so keep that uh, to yourself. I've given you a couple of hints. You might be able to figure out from that who this person is going to be. So as I said, I guarantee this is going to be an interesting uh, talk. Please do try and make it if you can. Um, there's a link there to RSVP. Should be, should be a lot of fun. Um, I will be hosting the question and answer period at the end. I will have an additional sign-up sheet with me. If you come and sign up to the sign-up sheet after the Q&A, there will be an additional 3% extra credit for this course. So please, please do come. Um, I was the one that suggested to UVM uh, that we invite Tan Lee. It's definitely an interesting HCI application. Uh, extra 3% uh, credit if you attend and sign the sign-up sheet. So after Q&A, when everybody's filing out, come up and just sign your name, 3%. Yes? Uh, is the RSVP just for like a number count, or do you actually get a ticket? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether you actually get a ticket or whether it's just for a number count, uh, but please do RSVP. I think it just helps uh, get everything ready beforehand. Okay, so that's uh, Tan Lee. Um, again, I was away uh, last week at a DARPA meeting, and uh, Professor Bagro was here, and I believe he walked you through some of his crowdsourcing research. Hopefully you found that interesting. Uh, it was also a timely lecture because in this look at the beginning of this looking out section, we're thinking about stitching technology into the world around us. And as we do, some of that technology is being used simultaneously by many people. So how can we farm out a task via the technology to a large number of people where they can collaboratively do something together and allow them to do something that would be difficult or impossible for them to do together? Or, for allow, or allow us, as the creators of the technology, to study something about social behavior among humans that would be difficult or impossible to do otherwise. OK, again, I was away last week uh, in Chicago. And as usual, I brought you back something to bribe you with, uh, given my absence. I have uh, Chicago Cubs and Chicago White Sox chocolate. As far as I understand, there are no nuts. Um, break yourself off a piece and pass it along to the next person. There you go. Okay, plenty for everyone this morning. Thanks for, uh, thanks for bearing with me with all the absences. I will be here until the remainder uh, of the semester.
Okay, so uh, where were we, where are we, and where are we going? Again, we're working our way through this section on looking outward, thinking about creating technology where it isn't a traditional one-on-one -on -one interaction between one person and one piece of tech. We've got a lot of people going about their daily business in the real world, carrying technology, moving through an environment in which there is technology stitches, stitched into the environment, uh, and so on, which is this idea of ubiquitous computing which we covered in lecture 16. In lectures 17, 18, and 19, we're looking at three different research projects, very different research projects. All of them are using ubiquitous technology to try and study something about people that was difficult or impossible to do before. So uh, at the beginning of last week, we looked at social network inference. So given the fact that someone, uh, people are walking around with a microphone relatively near their mouths, can you infer from their conversations among other people, what the social network is. Once you infer what the social network is, who knows whom and who tends to enter into conversations more often with whom, can you tell something about how they modify their behavior given where they are in the social network? Get a very difficult thing to do uh, without ubiquitous technology. We're going to finish our lecture today on activity tagging. So can we actually infer from this thing that you carry around in your pocket pretty much all day, every day, can you infer something about what someone is doing from moment to moment and use that to pass that raw data collected from the phone through a set of models that makes a prediction about whether today was more or less healthy compared to your days in the past. So we're talking about activity tagging, but we're looking, that it, we're looking at that in the larger context of mobile health monitoring. Some of you wear a Fitbit. If you're carrying one of these things around as well, it may, it may already or it may in future be able to infer something about how much sleep you're getting, how much activity you're getting, how much social interaction are you engaging in from day to day, and then use that to make an estimate about how, how your mental uh, and physical well-being is going. We're going to probably finish lecture 18 today, and we might start in on lecture 19 today, which is the human speech ohm project. What's the speech ohm here? What is an ohm or an omics? Uh, it's the development of human language. The development of human language. So we're going to, the human speech ohm project is about the development of, ch of language, in particular, how a human child goes about acquiring language. What do you think the word speech ohm means? What other words do you know that end in ohm? Genome. The genome, right? So the genome was mapped out back in the <coughs> 1990s, um, which was to take, uh, to take our genome and, and understand or be able to record from every single gene on the genome. So basically recording the entire thing. Anything else? Sorry? The chromosome. The chromosome, right, exactly. There is also the, now the Connectome, which is a project, a set of projects to try and understand in as much detail as possible the connectivity in the human brain. So map all the way down as far as we can go all of the details about the human brain. That's the Connectome. So the Speechome is a little bit of tongue in cheek, but it's an attempt to try and understand all aspects of speech or all aspects of speech acquisition. You all can speak English relatively well. You, most of you learned it when you were a very young child. How and what caused you to acquire language in the way you did at the rate that you did? The short answer is the moment nobody knows because it's a very, very difficult thing to measure. In the Human Speech Home Project, it's a somewhat controversial project where uh, someone's home was instrumented to record as much as possible the first three years of a human infant's life and then use that entire data set to try and understand how that child acquired language during their first three years of life. Okay, we'll come back to that in a moment. Let's go back to lecture 18. Uh, and before we do, let's just talk a little bit about uh, the deliverables. Um, hopefully most of you are on track to submit deliverable nine um, uh, Wednesday night. And then Thursday we will talk about the 10th and the final deliverable. Next week, when deliverable 10 is due, we will talk next week about what you will be doing between the submission of deliverable 10 and working on your final project through the rest of the semester until you present it orally during our examination period. We'll talk about that next week. All good? 
Any questions about the deliverables? Okay, all right. So back to lecture 18 and activity tagging. Uh, again, this is the idea of not just trying to uh, tag activities, but do this within the larger context of mobile health monitoring. This is developing into a huge industry. Um, what are all of the things that go into our physical and mental well well-being? There are obviously lots of aspects of our behavior that do. How all of these things combine to actually predict your well-being? Again, a very difficult thing to do. So we're going to focus in this lecture on just trying to use your smartphone to predict some of these aspects of uh, behavior. <coughs> Okay, so in the paper that we're talking about today, there were three goals. The first goal is to try and measure correlates of well-being. So one of these things like sleep, physical activity, social interaction, measure one of these things continuously and automatically. Right? We don't want to have someone continuously having to log how many hours of sleep you think you got, how many hours of exercise you think you got, how many conversations for a given day you participated in and so on. We want this to be automatic, and we want it as best as possible to be continuous. Once we are collecting these raw measurements, can we then push these measurements through a machine learning algorithm that will produce at the far end a prediction of your well-being? So uh, if you get four hours of sleep, hopefully that machine learning algorithm would output a negative number. It's probably not so good for you. If you got 13 hours of sleep or spent 13 hours in bed, hopefully it would also output that maybe that wasn't the best way to spend your night. But seven to eight hours, it would produce a positive number. Right? We might not be able to get much beyond that. We're just going for an approximate prediction about how these correlates are contributing to your well-being. And then finally, take these measurements or, or these predictions and create some visualization that we can present to the users that it's relatively easy to understand. Right? So imagine you can glance at your phone and it gives you sort of a picture about how you're doing in terms of sleep, physical activity, and social interaction for today, yesterday, last week, this week compared to last week, and so on. Something that's sort of relatively easy to understand and might help you try and modulate some of these things in the coming days and weeks to improve your well-being. Okay, that's what we're trying to do. We looked at some of the raw data last time. Let's actually dive in and look to see what they actually did. We're going to start with sleep, and we brainstormed about this uh, last time. Most of us have a more or less regular routine, and that includes our phone. Um, myself, I tend to plug in my phone at night. Uh, I sleep at about the same time. Obviously, my phone is not moving while I'm sleeping. Um, it's relatively quiet throughout the night and so on. So we might be able to take several measurements from a phone, again, assuming the user is okay with us doing so, and combine these measurements together and push them through uh, a model to predict how many hours of sleep we got. The uh, researchers used more or less that idea. They found that for the human subjects that participated in the study, that uh, the phone recharging, lack of motion, and ambient sound, or lack of ambient sound, was enough using a simple model. They didn't use the KNN algorithm, but they used something else that was relatively simple that could predict plus or minus 90 minutes how many sleep you got, uh, how much sleep you got. It's still off by a pretty big margin, but not bad. Okay. So we have raw data, which we're converting into number of hours of sleep. And then we're going to take numbers of hours of sleep and push it through this model, which is going to give us back a number which says whether the amount of sleep you got last night is positively or negatively impacting your uh, well-being. We're not going to go into the details of this. You'll notice there's an exponent here and a fraction here. Uh, what is this fraction? Well, on the numerator, we're taking the actual amount of sleep over a 24-hour period, as predicted by your phone. Subtracting the ideal amount of sleep, which according to the researchers is seven hours. Um, there was an interesting meta study that was published this week that looked at a whole bunch of sleep studies published in the literature. And it turns out that generally speaking, most people need about the same amount of sleep. A lot of people report they need much less or much more than seven hours. It turns out that for most people that report they need less or more, 
they're lying. They're not doing as well as those that report they need seven or eight and get seven or eight hours of sleep. Again, an active area of investigation, but for our purposes, we're going to assume most people need about the same amount uh, of sleep. So we're subtracting the ideal amount from the actual amount. So you can imagine if that difference is larger or smaller, uh, if that difference is larger, uh, you're, you, uh, it's negatively impacting well-being. If you're getting close to seven, you're doing all right. Okay. They're dividing by HR high and HR low, which is the upper limit and lower limit of acceptable sleep, which again is kind of interesting. I'm not sure how they came up with those numbers. Is that something that they derived or that something they got from the literature? But if you take this function and you plug in various values for these four variables, you get something that's not quite a bell curve, but pretty close to it, where the horizontal axis is the number of hours of sleep. And this model will give you back a prediction, which is the vertical height here of well-being. So we sort of have a two-stage process. We have raw sensor values from the phone being combined to predict the numbers of hours of sleep you got. The user doesn't have to type in how many hours of sleep they think they got. And then this model is predicting a number which is positively or negatively contributing to prediction of your physical well-being. That's sleep, relatively straightforward. Okay, let's move on to physical activity. This one is much more difficult because there are many different ways that you may go about getting physical activity during the day, and some of these are easier to collect with a phone than others. Walking, running, and biking, pretty easy. Swimming, not so easy, right? Physical context. So again, we're gonna do the same process we just did for sleep. We're gonna get an estimate which isn't perfect, because a lot of different ways of getting physical activity are going to be missed by the phone. The Fitbit might capture more, but still there are things that are going to be missed. Assuming that you're a user and you uh, allow this app to collect whether or not your battery is charging, clock, accelerometer, digital compass, GPS, microphone, and camera, how would you start to infer whether a user is getting activity, and better yet, which particular activity they're engaged in. Um, in terms of like just any physical activity, you can use the accelerometer. And in terms of differentiating between walking, running, biking, and more categories, swimming, GPS could be used. Possibly, yeah, exactly. That's it, right? So if I leave my phone in the locker, or better <coughs> let yet next to the pool, maybe I actually could infer swimming. Good point. The accelerometer is probably gonna be useful, right? So the first exercise here is sort of figuring out which subsets of our sensors are gonna be most useful. Accelerometer is going to be pretty useful, but it's also problematic. If you live near a pool, wouldn't it think that you're sleeping or, and or swimming when you're doing the opposite? Possibly, absolutely, right? This is not a trivial thing to do. Remember a few weeks back, uh, a few weeks back when we were talking about the KNN algorithm, and we started with flowers, and those flowers had four features. Who decided that those four features were the most useful features for predicting flowers? It was someone who knew flowers pretty well. Those were actually a pretty good choice. That's the feature selection problem in machine learning, right? We want to try and predict something from data. Where's that data gonna come from? Someone, hopefully an expert, has to decide what things are going to be measured, which things are going to produce the data that we're gonna train the machine learning algorithm on, right? So we're already in the business of choosing the features. Assuming we're gonna limit our investigation to a smartphone, we already have a relatively limited palette of the things we could choose anyways. And any one of these features on its own, or even a few, can always be fooled in some way, right? So we want to try and not just pick a single feature, but combinations of features, and figure out how to combine these features so that they corroborate one another. You could use the microphone, um, at least for walking, running, and maybe swimming, because you have the sound point of heat, and swimming, you're using some ambient noise. Yeah, absolutely, right? So the microphone might, might be useful, right? Especially for, uh, things where you're moving around, assuming you're, 
you have the smartphone on your person or it's a Fitbit and has a microphone, which I don't think it does, but if you have a microphone nearby enough, you might be able to use ambient sound. But again, it depends, right? Physical context matters here, cultural context, social context. When I go to the pool, I may or may not leave my phone next to the pool. It may be in my bag or not. So it's sort of 50-50 whether you're going to get ambient noise that would help. Potentially using the camera for swimming. Possibly. You could like set it up and like somehow get an angle of your lane. Absolutely. So there could be messages in the app that say if you go for a swim, just make sure that if the phone is outside your bags somehow, right? So now we're asking the user to help a little bit, which which may be okay. Ideally, we'd like to do this without the user having to do much. That's going to make things tricky. Let's focus on just the accelerometer for a moment, and let's forget swimming for a long time. Terrestrial sports, assume someone is actually wearing their smartphone, so we're getting accelerometer data. Still problematic. Why? Sorry? I might be in a car. I might be in a car on a country road in Vermont, in which case my accelerometer is going crazy and reporting it looks like I'm actually walking or running on, on a rough road. Right? Highway, maybe not. Right? Very different. So this is a very challenging thing uh, to do. A lot of study going into this. And obviously Fitbit and other devices show that there's a lot of money to be made if you can figure out how to do this well. So let's look at uh, physical activity. Let's, let's sketch out uh, a basic strategy for the moment. Let's assume we're going to try and focus on just inferring physical exertion from accelerometer data. Obviously, the first thing, uh, or the first thing we might want to do is try and measure human subjects' actual exertion. So let's get some physical data from someone when they are actually walking, running, or biking while wearing a phone. And the red here, I'm sorry, there was a typo on the slides for lecture 18. You might want to go back and correct that. We're going to measure actual exertion data from someone who is walking or running. At the same time, they're carrying their, or they're wearing their smartphone, so they're also getting accelerate, accelerometer data. We're then going to create a model that takes as input accelerometer data, and it's going to transform that data in some way to make a prediction. So the accelerometer the model is going to make a prediction about exertion. We also have actual exertion. So we're going to try and improve our model. We're going to alter our model so that it alters its predictions. And we're going to keep improving the model so that these predictions closer and closer match actual exertion. So we're going to train the model so that its prediction about the amount of exertion matches what's called ground truth. We, need, we know exactly how much calories the human subject is actually burning. Okay. How do we do that? Lots of different ways we can do that. Uh, in this particular study, um, they captured ground truth using a, a VO2 max or delta VO2, which is the change in oxygen, O2, and the change in volume of O2. So if you're wearing a mask that is able to record the amount of carbon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide and oxygen while you are exercising, the more you exercise, the more oxygen your, your muscles burn, and the more O2 is being pulled out of your in, uh, inhaled breaths. And it's pretty standard practice uh, in um, physiology uh, and um, physical uh, therapy. So we're going to measure while someone does this, and the more oxygen that's burned, the more uh, we can infer the more calories that are being burned. That's our ground truth. So we're going to measure VO2. We can then think about, well, where is VO2 coming from? Well, we can break this down into a function of resting metabolic rate. If you're in good shape, you burn less O2 when you're at rest than if you are not in good shape. You can then take the movement itself and think about the horizontal and vertical components. So now we're going to get really down into the nitty gritty details. How much is someone moving backward and forward? How much are they moving up and down? Why does that matter? Why would we want to break this into horizontal and vertical components? We're going to try and model these things in a moment. There's energy differences. There's energy differences. Kind of move forward and backwards. Absolutely. One is more onerous than the other. Why, why is that? Well, you could try to focus on walking. 
Absolutely. So walking and running have different horizontal and vertical components. Uh, absolutely, right? So up and down, up is hard because you're working against gravity. So we're really getting down now to trying to understand the components of physical motion and how to use that. Okay. Okay, so let's use our uh, accelerometer data and we're going to try and compute H first. In the moment, we're going to assume that we know something about the person's resting metabolic rate. We can maybe compute that beforehand. We're going to focus just on H and V for a moment. H is relatively easy because if we take accelerometer data, we're getting this bumping back and forth. And if you have a triaxial accel accelerometer, it's giving you how much someone is moving forward and back. To some degree, it's giving you up and down and left and right. We're going to collapse all three of those for the moment and just look at the frequency of acceler uh, acceleration across all three axes, which gives us just this sine wave, how much they're moving. We're going to assume, uh, we're going to set some threshold, and we're just going to count the number of times that this sinusoidal pattern pass it, passes the threshold. So if you're walking, running, or biking, or even if we measured this in the pool with swimming, these are all regular motions. They aren't random. So if they're regular, there's going to be this regular pattern. And if we measure the amount of times that this acceleration passes a particular threshold, we can just count it, which will give us back frequency, right? Frequency tell us, tells us how quickly someone is doing something per second. So depending on the person, we can tell more or less whether they're walking or running. What is the frequency of your footfalls as you walk? For most of us, it's more or less the same, not exactly the same. taken many steps in your life, you've probably maybe not, not actually thought about this. Maybe just a bit faster than the second. It's, it's a little bit faster than the second. It's around one second per footfall for most people, right? So if you're getting acceleration data and you're seeing that you're passing the threshold once per second, you can be relatively confident that it's the person walking. Right? If you're in a car that's going over a bumpy Vermont road, you might also be getting a value that's passing the threshold, but it's not doing it at a regular interval. Right? Whatever it is, it's not walking. Okay. So again, often um, in certain smartphones, we have triaxial uh, measurements. So we have up and down, side to side, and forward and back. We're assuming for the moment we don't have access to that. We're trying to infer this from the information. Okay. How do we go about computing V up and down? This one is a little bit trickier. We could, for example, use a barometer. If you have one on your smartphone, the higher up you go, the lower the air pressure. Not a great choice. Why not? Because you're only moving by centimeters up and down. Absolutely, right? So barometric pressure changes very, very little. It's not probably not going to be accurate enough. If you go to the top floor of this building, you're still inside. Barometric pressure is going to be more or less the same. So maybe that only helps you with vertical outs uh, in outside rather than inside. So we're going to use, we're going to try and use the accelerometer data again, but we just have the single signal. How would you infer V from that? could use that, right? So when you go up and over the top, right? So you can tell something about actually, are they lifting their leg or is their leg falling, if you're careful. And if they're going up or down, there's going to be a bit of an asymmetry in this information, right? Rising, should, there should be a little bit more rise than there is fall. So we might actually have to look at the shape of the curve itself, rather than just when the curve is passing some threshold. Right? So we look at the amount of time that the signal is rising, and if that's a little bit more than the time during which the signal is falling, then that's someone taking longer to raise their foot, and it takes less time for their foot to come down and hit and stop the oscillation and start the next one with the next foot, because their foot has hit the ground higher than where it left the ground. Right? 
We don't have a pressure sensor in the sole of the person's shoe, so we don't actually know when they're hitting the ground and leaving the ground. We're trying to infer all this from acceleration data, which again is a tricky thing to do, but with that hint, you might be able to train a machine learning algorithm uh, to do that. Okay, like all of these things, even given this heuristic, there are ways to trick it. How might it think, how might you get a false positive? It thinks you're walking uphill, but you're not. Stair climbing machine, which is fine. From your body's point of view, you're still climbing stairs. Absolutely, right? If, if you've ever been in a cast, your, your gait is asymmetric, right? Now, where, maybe wearing a cast is just as, as exerting as, as running, I don't know, but again, there are lots of things, again, thinking about somebody's daily life, where you might get a signal where it misinfers what's actually going on. Maybe wearing a cast is kind of a, a rare enough event that we don't have to think about it. But in all this mo mobile health monitoring, you can usually think of a large number of exceptions which are difficult to, to deal with. Tricky thing to do. Okay. Okay. So back to, back to what we're doing here. We're trying to measure actual exertion, get the data, create a model from the acceleration data, and produce a prediction of exertion. And then we're going to try and improve this model like we did uh, for sleep. In this paper, they kind of cheated a little bit. They didn't go to all the effort we just talked about. They talked about it in the paper and then said, that's pretty complicated. Let's take a step back and try something slightly easier, which is, first of all, to just recognize individual tasks, more or less like we were just talking about, driving, stationary, running, or walking. They then, instead of fitting their human subjects with VO2 uh, instruments and having them run or walk uh, on a treadmill, they went to the literature and they looked up the metabolic equivalent for these tasks. So how much does the average person, how many calories does the average person burn when they're performing any of these four uh, activities? And then take uh, tags of these, so throughout the day, which of these four tasks was the person involved in, and multiply that period of time by the metabolic equivalent of task, and sum that all up. So figure out what MET is for walking, and if you infer that someone was walking for two hours, take that ME2 and multiply it by two, the number of calories per hour, and sum all of that up, and that gives you MET actual, which is the actual aerobic activity per day. You probably want to mentally put scare quotes around actual because we're not actually measuring their exertion, we're predicting it. So here's our prediction down here, metabolic uh, uh, actual, which again, we're getting back from a model. And now we're gonna push this through a second model, which is this one. It kind of looks like the sleep model that we were looking at before, but with an important difference, which is there's, real no, there's no real upper bound on this. So this assumes the more exercise you get per day, the better, which is probably not true. If you're walking or running for five or six or seven hours a day, that might not be the best thing for your body in the long term. Regardless, we're going to just assume that more of this means more, more physical well-being. They're multiplying it by high and low and subtracting low just to try and normalize this between the maximum recommended aerobic activity per day and the minimum recommended per day. So sort of where do you lie in this range? So we now are armed with two models, one which is looking to see whether your sleep is as close as possible to seven hours, more or less. The second one, uh, physical, activi uh, physical activity, which is looking at physical exertion. That one's giving you back another number, which is basically how much, uh, high, how much aerobic exercise are you getting per day or per week. We got two. We're now going to tackle social interaction. And again, we can't measure that directly, so we're going to try and infer it. What are we going to use in this case? The microphone, like we did in the previous, uh, in the previous experiment. And we're going to measure the number of hours per day that they're involved in a conversation, which is going to be the duration here, the actual duration of conversations. And then again, we're going to normalize it 
by high and low. And again, this model looks like the one that we just looked at. So the assumption here, that, which is the more conversation you're involved in throughout the day, the better. Again, that's probably not a very good, uh, not very accurate, but good enough for most purposes. If you're not involved in any conversations at all throughout the day or the next day or the day after that, maybe not the best thing for your mental well-being. Okay, they're using the microphone for this. What could possibly go wrong here? What are some false positives and false negatives? Music. Sorry? Music. music, right? A false positive, someone's singing and you're in the music and your phone picks it up. You're not engaged in social interaction, or maybe you are, depending on how you define it. Yep? Uh, kind of along the same notes, like watching TV or something. Watching TV, right? There's lots of human voices that your microphone might pick up throughout the day. Hard to say whether those are human voices uh, of an actual human that you're engaged in a conversation with. Maybe you're talking to yourself out loud. That's a good one, right? Is that good or not for your well-being? I don't know. Maybe that should positively count. That, that's an interesting one. We need a psychologist for that one. Yes? You can pick up a nearby conversation. Pick up. Absolutely, right? You're sitting in the library trying to study, and there are two other students nearby that are yakking away, and your, your microphone is picking that up. OK. Could be in a classroom. Could be in a classroom. You're picking up my voice, unfortunately, for 75 minutes. Right? OK. Again, not an easy thing to do. If you go back and look at the previous uh, lecture, there were, again, ways that they tried to, act, to really dig down into the microphone data and improve the prediction that someone is involved in a face-to-face -face conversation. Assuming you have access to the raw data coming from a microphone, you, you could imagine creating more and more sophisticated machine learning algorithms where you get better and better at making that actual uh, prediction. Okay, again, we're gonna, we're gonna normalize this and assume more conversations, the better. Here's some actual data reported from the paper for uh, a given subject. How is this subject doing throughout their week? Is this a healthy week, an unhealthy week? What's that? They had a cheat day on Friday. Activity. activity, absolutely. Yeah, maybe they were they were couch surfing all day. Who, who knows? Okay. Remember, in this case, green, which is activity or physical, and blue is social. In this simplified set of models, more activity and more social is better. So the dip in activity here. Uh, again, we have to take this with a grain of salt. Red is sleep, where uh, in that case there's more can be bad and less can be bad. We're looking for the sweet spot. So it's a little difficult to say from this picture exactly how well this person uh, is doing. But again, assuming this is you, you might be able to look at this and say, my gosh, I didn't realize you know, how, little, how little I got done on Friday and Saturday. I better pick up my workout routine next week. The end of the paper, they introduced this cute little visualization. Of course, uh, this was uh, early 2000s, so this was fun because you could actually do this on a phone. Uh, I think the clown fish was, the orange fish there was for exercise, and the school of fish was your amount of socialization. So the more conversations you were involved in over the last few days, the larger the school of fish, and the turtle there is either sleeping or not sleeping. I don't know how helpful that is. The idea was to try and create some simplified visualization where at a glance, you would get an idea of how you're doing in terms of these three correlates of well-being from day to day, right? Might not be everyone who's willing to look at technical graphs. Can we make this somewhat interesting for the common user? Okay, it's an interesting paper. The reason I picked this one is this, this is one of the first papers to try and get at mobile health monitoring, and I hope that throughout this lecture, you've seen this is a very challenging uh, thing to do. Fitbit and other devices are getting better, but it's extremely difficult to infer from raw data what a user is doing throughout their day and whether that is positively or negatively impacting their well-being. We could ask them, but often self-reporting is very misleading. I could ask you how many hours of sleep you got yesterday, 
And you may tell me how many hours of sleep you got me the night before, but you might have forgotten that you also nodded off for half an hour at lecture during the day, right? How much total sleep did you get throughout the day? Was it a whole bunch of naps during your lectures and then four hours at night? Or you managed to stay awake during all your lectures and you got a full night of uninterrupted sleep? Those things matter, right? You might neglect to mention that or to type that into an app. If we had an app that was recording your activity throughout the day and night, it might be able to get at that or disambiguate those two types of sleep patterns and communicate it back to you. Okay. Okay, so again, just to summarize here, we were only, or this paper, uh, these researchers were only trying to get at these three correlates of well-being. They didn't tackle intellectual stimulation, diet, and stress. Even with these three, which are relatively easier to infer and predict than the others, lots, lots of challenges and difficulties there. Okay, so that's the end of lecture uh, 18. We're going to move on now in lecture uh, 19 to the Human Speech Home Project. This is the third and final research project we're going to look at where they tried to use ubiquitous technology to study some aspect of human behavior. And in this case, we're going to look at uh, speech or language. And we're going to look in particular at how human children tend to acquire language. Again, without technology, this is a very difficult thing to do. One parent may happen to be around the first time that a child says their first world word. They may not. It may, be, it may be someone else who happens to hear it. Even if they do hear the child utter the word for the first time, that parent and psychologists have absolutely no idea why the child issued that particular word at that point in time in that room of the house in the presence of that particular parent. It's a very difficult thing to do. What is the physical context, social context, and cultural context that surrounds a child in the first years of life that supports them <coughs> up until they utter a given word for the first time? Sort of a mysterious uh, phenomenon. Can we use technology to understand this process better? Okay, so we're going to look at some work that was reported back in 2009 now. So again, it's a little bit dated. There's been a lot of work since, but it was a very landmark study uh, at the time. They're going to try and tackle the following questions. How do children learn language? What aspect of a child's physical and social environment influence language learning? And what events in their past, what event in the last second, last minute, last hour, last day, last month, last year, influenced language learning? So you can imagine it's a very tricky thing to do. How is this normally done? So again, I've mentioned this before, developmental psychology, the study of uh, human development as, children, as humans go from child to adult. What are the processes that are going on that scaffold them? that provides support for them to start to master various tasks that you need to, under, you need to master in order to be a fully functioning adult. One of the most important ones, obviously, is language. Okay, so a typical approach, uh, we invite a parent and a child into the lab. We observe the child for a short period of time. Usually this is a few minutes or a few hours in a controlled setting, a laboratory. And for example, during that, we might ask the parent to just play with the child in the way that the parent normally plays with the child. And as scientists, as psychologists, we might observe very carefully this interaction. We might observe at a certain point in time that the parent, in, like you see in the picture here, the parent looks at an object and repeatedly pronounces the name of that object, blue block. At the same time, the child is looking at the parent's eyes, not the object. It figures out where the parent is looking and uses that information to pay attention to the same object. Question. Sure. Uh, that's a great question, right? How, does, how do we even know that the child heard the word blue block? They heard it. It landed on their ears. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, right? The difference between sensation and perception. They sensed the word blue block. It arrived at their ear, but they may not have perceived it. 
It may have just sounded like a bunch of round, random syllables, right? It's a very good question. And again, there's no clear answer to that. However, if the parent utters the word blue block and a few seconds later the child says blue block, there's some behavioral evidence that they heard it. If they don't say it, you don't know that they didn't perceive it, right? That's, that's tricky, the unknown unknown, okay. So um, continuing the example here, the child looks at the parent's eyes and we see the child look at the parent's eyes and then we see the child saccade or move what they're looking at so they're no longer looking at the parent, they're looking at uh, the object. And the moment they look at that other object, they say the object's uh, they, say, they say the name of the object, blue block, right? Okay, that's what we might see. While we're observing that, we're already forming a hypothesis about how children acquire language, and the hypothesis is they acquire it using something called joint attention. Remember we talked about attention uh, a few weeks back? The parent is attending to the blue block, not the child. The child is not a attending to the blue block, the child is attending to the parent, so there is not joint attention. They're attending to different things, but this interaction, the child looking at the parent's eyes is scaffolding, the, the direction of the, of the parent's eyes is telling the child where to look, and they both attend to the same object. I can say to you, look at the photograph in the slide, I'm not looking at the photograph in the slide, I'm telling you verbally, and now you and I are both jointly attending to the photograph in the slide, right? Because you understand language, I don't need to scaffold you by giving you a very strong hint about where I want you to look. With children, you'll notice that parents and caregivers do that quite a bit, right? That's all well and good, but this is what's known as being theory laden. We're laden with the theory about how children acquire language. We're coming to this with a bias about how we think ch child, children acquire language. What we would like to do is step back from theory and hypotheses and let the data do the talking. Collect as much data as we can about the physical and social context surrounding a child and from that raw data start to infer how children learn language. We don't want to go into this process with a hypothesis, which is, I think children acquire language using joint attention. We observe parents and children, we're already kind of biased, we're kind of looking for that already. Aha, we see joint attention, That's we were right. That's how children acquire language. Starting with the hypothesis is great, that's the way we learned about the scientific method in high school, but it has pitfalls, which is that we often miss other hypotheses about how children acquire language that may be very non-intuitive for us, but unfortunately that might be how things actually work. Okay, so uh, in Professor Roy's approach that we're going to look at today, uh, instead of observing a child for a short period of time in a controlled setting, uh, Professor Roy and his wife instrumented their home with cameras and microphones and they recorded or they observed through these cameras and microphones the first three years of life uh, of their own child in its own home. This is a longitudinal study, it went on very long, it went on for three uh, years. It's extremely controversial. This is a scientist who studied their own child. So this counts as a human subject research study. We're studying humans. Typically when you uh, conduct a human studies experiment, you have to obtain consent from the participants. This is a very young child, so you can't obtain consent from a child. So in human subject studies, when you're studying children, if the child can't sign the waiver form, the parent does. In this case, the parent and the investigator are the same person. There's a very clear uh, conflict of interest. It's extremely controversial. However, we're going to talk about this study. If you have a problem with this study, you're more than welcome to leave the room at this point. No harm, no foul. All good? Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. So I will let Professor Roy describe the experiment in his own words. Um, in the TED Talk, we'll watch the TED Talk. It's about, I think it's about six or seven minutes long. After that, we'll come back and look at this study in a little more detail and investigate the HCI components of this work.
If 19 minutes, we're not going to watch the whole thing. <clears throat> Imagine if you could record your life. Everything you said, everything you did, available in a perfect memory store at your fingertips. So you could go back and find memorable moments and relive them, or sift through traces of time and discover patterns in your own life that previously had gone undiscovered. Well, that's exactly the journey that my family began five and a half years ago. This is my wife and collaborator, Rupal. And on this day, at this moment, we walked into the house with our first child, our beautiful baby boy. And we walked into a house with a very special home video recording system. Okay. This moment and thousands of other moments special for us were captured in our home because in every room in the house, if you looked up, you'd see a camera and a microphone. And if you looked down, you'd get this bird's eye view of the room. Here's our living room, the baby bedroom, kitchen, dining room and the rest of the house. And all of these fed into a disk array that was designed for continuous capture. So here we are flying through a day in our home as we move from sunlit morning through incandescent evening, and finally lights out for the day. Over the course of three years, we recorded eight to 10 hours a day, amassing roughly a quarter million hours of multi-track audio and video. So you're looking at a piece of what is by far the largest home video collection ever made. <laughs> I think that's clear. And what this data represents for our family at a personal level, the, the, the impact has already been immense and we're still learning its value. Countless moments of unsolicited natural moments, not posed moments, are captured there and we're starting to learn how to discover them and find them. But there's also a scientific reason that drove this project, which was to use this kind of natural longitudinal data to understand the process of how a child learns language, that child being my son. And so with many privacy provisions put in place to protect everyone who's recorded in the data, we made elements of the data available to my trusted research team at MIT so we could start teasing apart patterns in this massive data set, trying to understand the influence of social environments on language acquisition. So we're looking here at one of the first things we started to do. This is my wife and I cooking breakfast in the kitchen. And as we move through space and through time, a very everyday pattern of life in the kitchen, in order to convert this opaque 90,000 hours of video into something we can start to see, we use motion analysis to pull out, as we move through space and through time, what we call space-time worms. And this has become a part of our toolkit for being able to look and see where the activities are in the data, and with it, trace the patterns of, in particular, where my son moved throughout the home, so that we could focus our transcription efforts, all the speech environment, around my son, all the words that he heard from myself, my wife, our nanny, and over time the words he began to produce. So with that technology and that data and the ability to, with machine assistance, transcribe speech, we've now transcribed well over seven million words of our home transcripts. And with that, let me take you now for a first tour into the data. So you've all, I'm sure, seen time-lapse videos where a flower will blossom as you accelerate time. I'd like you to now experience the blossoming of a speech form. My son, soon after his first birthday, would say gaga to mean water. And over the course of the next half year, he slowly learned to approximate the proper adult form, water. So we're going to cruise through half a year in about 40 seconds. No video here, so you can focus on the sound, the acoustics of a new kind of trajectory. Gaga to water. Okay, okay, okay. 
He sure nailed it, didn't he? So he didn't just learn water. Over the course of the 24 months, the first two years that we really focused on, this is a map of every word he learned in chronological order. And because we have full transcripts, we've identified each of the 503 words that he learned to produce by his second birthday. He was an early talker. And so we started to analyze why. Why were certain words born before others? This is one of the first results that came out of our study uh, a little over a year ago that really surprised us. The way to interpret this apparently simple graph is on the vertical is an indication of how complex caregiver utterances are based on the length of utterances. And the vertical axis is time. And all of the data we aligned based on the, the following idea. Every time my son would learn a word, we would trace back and look at all of the language he heard that contained that word. And we would plot the relative length of the utterances. And what we found was this curious phenomena that caregiver speech would systematically dip to a minimum, making language as simple as possible, and then slowly ascend back up in complexity. And the amazing thing was that the, that bounce, that dip, lined up almost precisely with when each word was born, word after word, systematically. So it appears that all three primary caregivers, myself, my wife, and our nanny, were systematically, and I would think subconsciously, restructuring our language to meet him at the moment of the birth of a word and bring him gently into more complex language. And the implications of this, there are many, but one I just want to point out is that there must be amazing feedback loops. It's not, of course, my son is learning from his linguistic environment, but the environment is learning from him. That environment, people, are in these tight feedback loops and creating a kind of scaffolding that has not been noticed until now. But that's looking at the speech context. What about the visual context? We're now looking at, think of this as a dollhouse cutaway of, the, of our house. We've taken those circular fisheye lens cameras and we've done some optical correction and then we can bring it into a three-dimensional life. So welcome to my home. This is a moment one moment captured across multiple cameras. The reason we did this is to create the ultimate memory machine where you can go back and interactively fly around and then breathe video life into this system. What I'm going to do is give you an accelerated view of 30 minutes, again, of just life in the living room. That's me and my son on the floor. And there's video analytics that are tracking our movements. My son is leaving red ink, I'm leaving green ink. We're now on the couch looking out through the window at cars passing by, and finally my son playing in a walking toy by himself. Now we freeze the action, 30 minutes. We turn time into the vertical axis, and we open up for a view of these interaction traces we've just left behind. And we see these amazing structures, these little knots of two colors of, of thread we call social hotspots. The spiral thread we call a solo hotspot. And we think that these affect the way language is learned. What we'd like to do is start understanding the interaction between these patterns and the language that my son is exposed to to see if we can predict how the structure of when words are heard affects when they're learned. So in other words, the relationship between words and what they're about in the world. So here's how we're approaching this. In this video, again, my son is being traced out. He's leaving red ink behind, and there's our nanny by the door. You want to go there? All right. She offers water, and off go the two worms over to the kitchen to get water. And what we've done is use the word water to tag that moment, that bit of activity. And now we take the power of data and take every time my son ever heard the word water and the context he saw it in, and we use it to penetrate through the video and find every activity trace that co-occurred with the instance of water. And what this data leaves in its wake is a landscape. We call these wordscapes. This is the wordscape for the word water. And you can see most of the action is in the kitchen. That's where those big peaks are over to the left. And just for contrast, we can do this with any word. We can take the word by 
as in goodbye. And we're now zoomed in over the entrance to the house, and we look and we find, as you'd expect, a contrast in the landscape where the word by occurs much more in a structured way. So we're using these structures to start predicting the order of language acquisition, and, and that's uh, sort of ongoing work now. In my lab, which we're peering into now at MIT, this is at the Media Lab, this has become my favorite way of videographing just about any space. Three of the key people in this project, Philip DeCamp, Ronnie Kubat, and Brandon Roy are pictured here. Uh, Philip has been a close collaborator on all the visualizations you're seeing. And Michael Fleischman was another PhD student in my lab who worked with me on this home video analysis. And he made the following observation, that just the way that we're analyzing how language connects to events which provide common ground for language, that same idea we can take out of your home, Deb, and we can apply it to the world of public media. And so our effort took an unexpected turn. Think of mass media as providing common ground. And you have the recipe for taking this idea to a whole new place. We've started analyzing television content using the same principles, analyzing event structure of a TV signal, episodes of shows, commercials, all of the components that make up the event structure. And we're now, with satellite dishes, pulling in and analyzing a good part of all the TV being watched in the United States. And you don't have to now go and instrument living rooms with microphones to get people's conversations. You just tune into publicly available social media feeds. So we're pulling in about 3 billion comments a month. And then the magic happens. You have the event structure, the common ground that the words are about coming out of the television feeds, You've got the conversations that are about that, those topics. And through semantic analysis, and this is actually real data you're looking at from our data our, our processing, each yellow line is showing a link being made between a comment in the wild and a piece of event structure coming out of the television signal. And the same idea now can be built up, and we get this wordscape, except now words are not assembled in my living room, Instead, the context, the common ground, the activities are the content on television that's driving the conversations. And so what we're seeing here, these skyscrapers now, are commentary that are linked to content on television. Same concept, but looking at communication dynamics in a different, very different sphere. Okay, I think we will leave it there. Um, who would be interested in knowing who's commenting on social media about which television shows? Who would be most interested in that? You bet. So great way to monetize this, this approach. We're not going to focus on that part. Let's go back and talk about uh, language acquisition. Let's talk for a moment about the audio clip that you heard about his son trying to pronounce the word water. In that clip itself, there are a lot of clues that might suggest hypotheses you might form about how this particular human built an understanding of what the word water means, right? So we're going from raw data, which at the moment is just that audio clip, to hypothesis formulation. Ideas? Well, maybe not hypothesis, but an observation was that every once in a while he would say something that sounded kind of like water before he got to like the end point, and he'd be like water, and then he'd go back to like the gag. Absolutely. So it wasn't, it was non-monotonic, right? So it wasn't gradually approaching the proper pronunciation of the word water. There were improvements and reversals and so on, right? So language acquisition is already a simplification, right? A child might start to grasp a word and then lose it again uh, and make more progress. What might lead a child to master the word water? And there was a hint in the audio transcript itself. Okay, and that's the graph. We're going to talk about that in a moment. You mentioned scaffolding. That's an important point. Where he kind of developed his T, and then so it was like, what? You know? And then so I think someone was like reinforcing like, the T in water. That might have been. So we might go back to when and where those parts of the audio transcript were made, and was one of, were one of the three caregivers pronouncing their T's nearby in time and space, right? 
you go back and watch the video and listen to that clip, there are a few clips in which you can hear water in the background, right? Which, in retrospect, is maybe not so surprising. As Professor Roy pointed out, often words are co-located in space and time with events where you would tend to hear that word. The front door, you tend to hear the word by pretty more often than other places in the house, and places where you tend to hear the word water, as you saw in that landscape with the mountains, tends to be in the kitchen and the, the bathroom, right? So we might already start to form a hypothesis, which seems relatively straightforward, that words are acquired near the events relevant to that, that word, okay. So that's just an example of this process where we're trying to go from data to hypotheses rather than the other way around. Rather than dreaming up a hypothesis and picking and choosing the data that we collect, that's obviously biased. We want to try and start in an agnostic manner as possible. Let's start with this massive raw data set, listen and watch the raw data, and then start to form hypotheses. Okay. We got nine minutes left, so let's just dive down into a few aspects of this uh, experiment. Let's start with the HCI part, right? So we're trying to construct a novel HCI system here. There's gonna be interactions between four people, the two parents, the nanny and the child, and a bunch of computers in a novel way. They instrumented uh, 11 omnidirectional cameras, so 11 of the rooms they had a more or less uh, full video uh, coverage of those rooms, 14 microphones as well. The raw data cell, uh, set itself, they collected data from nine to 24 months of age, which tends to be the most sensitive period for language uh, acquisition. This is when children acquire language at the fastest rate, it slows down beyond that point. Uh, they used uh, over 4,000 hours of recording time for 444 of those days. Um, from a total of 90,000, 140,000 uh, uh, of audio, 200 terabytes. This was unprecedented at the time. This is still a pretty big data set. As Professor Roy said, this is the biggest home movie ever made and maybe will ever be, be made. We'll see. About 10 hours of recording per day during the day. So we're not capturing data at night, right? Already there is bias creeping in. You can try and minimize bias. We can't get away from it altogether. They think they got between 70 and 80 percent of the child's waking hours. Luckily for most very young children, most of their waking time is spent in the home. Typically five or six of the cameras were active at any given time. So that's the hardware and that's the amount of data that is being pulled off this hardware during that period. Just to really emphasize this point, most of the work done in psychology to understand humans is theory-laden. Psychologist comes up with a theory about why humans do what they do. They then create some controlled environment in a lab to try and test that yes or no. Comes with a lot of biases. Okay, so we're going to try and instead start with raw data and go to hypotheses. Okay, so let's look at a few pieces of this pipeline. It's very sophisticated. We've got the hardware and the raw data taking the raw data and then we're trying to turn that raw data into who, what, where, what, and how, right? Who was saying what and how were they saying that? You remember, um, you remember two lectures back, we were looking at not just the content of language, but things like frequency, how quickly were things said, volume, pitch, all sorts of things, how things were said. In order to do that, we need to do word level speech transcription. We need to go through raw audio and try and pull, pull out words. This work was all done just before the deep learning revolution. So probably machine learning algorithms could do this automatically. Back then it was done manually. Crossity, this is again, just a fancy word for how things are said. From the video, we can try and uh, identify more or less automatically who was where, what were they doing and how and with what. So we're, we're trying to get information about people, activities, and objects, and the interactions between them. Okay, so here's our raw data. We're gonna try and use machine learning or machine perception as much as possible, but we probably need to augment this with human analysis. It's not possible to capture, pull words, and who, what, where, when, and how directly from data back then. 
At the end, we want to try and get information to answer this question. When was a word spoken by the child for the first time? Can we find the exact moment in time in which the child said water with a hard T uh, for the first time? And how often was the word spoken by caregivers beforehand? So we're already starting to form a hypothesis here. Okay. They created a whole bunch of different applications, HCI applications, to help with this. So uh, Professor Roy had an army of grad students that were pro trying to process that raw data. They created this total recall, which was a way to scan backwards and forwards through 90,000 hours of video, right? It's not an easy thing to do. How do you zoom in on where, what, when, and how in three, basically three years worth of activity being pulled from 11 cameras in parallel. Huge, huge data set. Audio is visualized with spectrogram, spectrograms, which if you learn to recognize these things, tell you whether you're looking at speech or background noise, like water, uh, uh, like a shower running, for example. Um, video is processed to highlight movement and remove static areas. You saw that in the video. They basically erased everything that wasn't moving and only focused on things that were moving. Um, which of the 25 audio and visual channels should be viewed at any given time? And in this application, it was interactive. You could change the time scale from years down to seconds. Right? There's, this is very much a needle in the haystack problem. In 90,000 hours of video, I want you to find the, the place and time during which the child mentioned the word mother for the first time. Go. How do you go about finding that, assuming that you don't have a machine learning algorithm that can do it for you? Not an easy thing to do. Okay. Here's an example of uh, speech tagging. We just looked at activity tagging. So you're going through raw audio and trying to tag uh, words. So they created this Blitzscribe uh, application, another HCI application, which was trying to transcribe uh, speech from raw data as quickly as possible. So at that time, automatic speech recognition error rates were about 75%. Not accuracy, but error, right? Terrible, terrible. Manual speech recognition was required. So I'd like you to listen to 90,000 hours of a child babbling and find the moment in time in which they said mother for the first time, right? An agonizing task. What machines can do is pick out, again, erase everything that isn't spoken speech which might leave the television playing, the radio playing, still a pretty big haystack in which to find uh, a needle. Do a little bit of transcription as best you can, listen to the segment and type what was heard. So here's the computer's guess about what was said in about a seven second uh, period of time. You can click and actually listen to that, those seven seconds and then you would rapidly tick off, you know, is a particular word present in that piece of uh, audio or not, right? So relatively quick, but still very painless. So with Blitz, Blitzcribe, one hour of recording takes more than an hour to transcribe, right? A very, very labor-intensive process. Okay, that's all the hardware, the HCI. I think we will leave the actual science till Thursday. You have a quiz due tonight. Uh, you're working on deliverable nine. And we will talk about deliverable 10 on Thursday. Have a good day.